when the Buddha talks about goodwill, he discusses it in two contexts. In one case he talks about it as a type of right resolve. The word resolve here can also mean intention, a way of thinking, something you've set your mind on. He also talks about it as a kind of mindfulness, something you keep in mind. In neither case is it a feeling. In other words, we're not asked necessarily to have feelings of warmth or love or even liking for other people. But it is an intention we want to develop that we're not going to harm, and that we would like to see other people act in ways that are not harmful, either towards ourselves or towards other people, towards themselves. So it's perfectly normal that there will be people out there you don't like, and yet you can still have feelings of goodwill for them. This is what the mindfulness is for, something you keep in mind that regardless of whether you like somebody or don't like them, you will not try to act in a way that's harmful. This is an important distinction, because many of us feel that there are people out there we have grudges against, people we don't like, and we feel guilty because we don't like them. We feel somehow we should feel love and warmth for them. As I've said before, there's that passage in the sutta we chanted just now. It talks about caring for your sense of goodwill in the same way that a mother would care for her child. Sometimes that's mistranslated as having a love for all beings the same way that a mother would love her only child. But that's impossible. The love you have for a child is very different from the love you would have, say, for even someone else in your family, much less other people outside the family, or for people who've really wronged you or people who've wronged those you love. What the Buddha is actually saying here is that you want to look after your goodwill the same way that a mother would look after her only child. You're trying to protect your intentions, because you know that your intentions are important. They shape your life now and can shape it far into the future. And as the Buddha often said, feelings are an unreliable guide to, to action. There are lots of things we like to do, but we either we don't know that they're going to give, give rise to harmful results, or they we know they're going to give rise to harmful results, but we let our likes take over. Other things we don't like to do, even though we know that they're going to give rise to good results. So you have to put the mind in a position that it's not going to let its likes or dislikes be in charge. And a lot of that has to do with learning to talk to yourself in the right way. And that's a lot of what Right Resolve is all about. Now the mind does not operate totally on its understanding of things. Feelings do have a role in the way we act, the way we think. This is one of the reasons why we try to give rise to feelings of well-being within ourselves through the breath, through the meditation. So we can have a sense of nourishment, that sense of inner well-being makes it a lot easier to look at things we don't like to look at or to do things we ordinarily wouldn't like to do, or act in a harmless and kind way with people we don't ordinarily like. When the mind is feeling hungry, a lack of pleasure, it'll look for pleasure anywhere. And sometimes there's a pleasure in getting getting revenge on others, or doing things that we know we are really unskillful, or pretending that something we deep down inside know is unskillful, but pretending that it's okay. 
the pleasure there is a pretty, pretty miserable pleasure. It's like finding that you have a taste for rotten food. You're kind of embarrassed about it, so you don't want anyone else to see you eating it. You don't even want to admit to yourself that you like eating it, but then you can go ahead and nibble on it in the dark. That's because we don't have a greater sense of well-being inside, so we're really hungry for just anything that we can think of. So this is one of the reasons why Meditating on your breath, giving rise to a sense of fullness, rapture, pleasure, is a gift not only to yourself but also to other people, other beings. If you can create this sense of well-being inside, then even when you're dealing with someone you don't like, you don't feel the need or the hunger to get back at that person or to act on your feelings of dislike. You can see them as something separate. They're part of the committee of the mind. But just because a committee has a few unskillful members doesn't mean that they have to take over. And if you're nourishing the, the good members of the committee, they can get stronger. This comes under the Buddha's teachings on fabrication. There are three ways that we fabricate our our emotions, our intentions. One is through the way we breathe. And this is something we can have some control over. Try to breathe in a way that's comfortable, breathe in a way that feels nourishing. Then there's also the, the way we talk to ourselves about things. For instance, we try to keep in mind this mindfulness of goodwill. that we want to act on good intentions, we don't want to harm other beings, even though there may be contrary desires in the mind that actually wants to, that want to harm people. We can say no. We recognize them as something we don't want to identify with. And we give ourselves lots of good reasons for why acting on skillful intentions really is in our own best interest. Now, it's a lot easier to convince yourself of that and to actually act on those understandings. If you have that sense of well-being inside, again, this is why we work with the breath. Then finally there are perceptions and feelings. The perception here is how you look at things, the label the mind has or the image the mind has when you're thinking about a particular issue. And we get practice with this, with the concentration. You learn how to perceive the breath in different ways. This is something that's very intimate. Just the way you feel the breathing inside, the way you picture the breathing to yourself, can actually have a huge impact on how you actually feel the breath. And this will have an impact on the mind. If you can put aside your image of the breath as some, just the air coming in and out of the lungs, then think of it more of as an energy that suffuses the body. When the breath comes in, it doesn't have to fight against the sensations that are already there in the body. Think of it energizing them, blending with them. That's a different perception. Hold that in mind and see what it does to how you feel the breath and the sense of pleasure or well-being that comes. Now we practice, when we practice with the breath, we're practicing with these different kinds of fabrication. So we can get a sense that we can change them if we want. Now we have good fabrications. We have practice with good fabrications. So that when unskillful fabrications come into the mind, you realize that you don't have to take them as your real feelings or your real thoughts on the matter. You can see them as something that's been fabricated in reaction to other people's actions, your own feelings, the things you've done in the past. If you see that they're unskillful, you're in a position where you can say, well, let's change it. Let's change the perception, change the, change the way you breathe for the time being so you feel less threatened by a particular situation. 
change the way you perceive it, change the way you think about it. As you remember, this mindfulness of goodwill, that you don't want to harm yourself, you don't want to harm others. And this is important. All too often we view our feelings as something real, as a message from deep inside that this is what we really believe about something or really feel about something. But when you understand that all these things are fabricated, either through past actions or present actions, you have the freedom not to identify. You have the freedom to fabricate or to shape the present in a new way. That's an important freedom. And we use the Buddhist teachings in the Eightfold Path, particularly Right Resolve, as our guide. We don't want to harm anybody. Even though they're members of the committee that seem intent on harming others or sometimes harming ourselves. We want to strengthen the other members of the committee so they can win out, so the choices we do make are skillful. And our original intention to be harmless actually gets actualized in our thoughts, words, and deeds. And we develop concentration in order to strengthen that resolve and to make it easier to maintain that mindfulness and have it be effective whenever the committee is running all over the place or pulling in different directions. You want to strengthen that mindfulness and that resolve so that they win out more and more consistently. And then finally they take over the whole committee. And there's no more internal strife. <laughs>